If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech and you'll find Hello, and welcome to the Populist Dialogues, a project of the Alliance for Democracy. Our purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. I'm your host, David Delk. Today we have video from an address recorded at the First Unitarian Church recently of an event sponsored by the Alliance for Democracy. The presenter is Thomas Lindsay. Thomas is founder and chief spokesperson for a Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. CELDEF has moved from being a traditional environmental law firm to one which defends communities' rights by enacting community rights ordinances acting first in Pennsylvania to enact laws which forbid corporate farming, they have passed such ordinances in over 150 communities, including in Pittsburgh, where the city council acted to ban fracking within their boundaries. Here is Thomas Lindsay. If you think corporations bought free speech before, Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. So we had to be dragged kicking and screaming into this process because folks had finally gotten to a point where they were willing to become disobedient enough to actually frontally disobey the law. Right? And that hasn't really happened in massive numbers for the past 120 some years. In fact, the last real movement that we had in the United States was probably the populist movement of late took on the banking companies and the railroad corporations, actually the economic structure of stuff uh, that was so basic in some ways to the country about who decides. You know, who decides on big issues like agriculture and transportation and energy? All those things have been centralized up, mostly to the federal government, some of the state government, but away from our hands. They don't want our digits anywhere near that stuff, right? They don't want us at the lower level making any of those kinds of decisions. But they want to centralize control over that stuff higher up. Mm -hmm. It hasn't happened in a long time in the United States, and there's only, almost been a Pavlovian system of punishment existing in the U.S. So when folks in the state of Virginia back in the 90s passed an out-of-state waste ban, you know, to stop out-of-state waste from coming into Virginia and filling up their landfills, radical idea. They want their own shit to fill their landfills rather than stuff from New York State and other places that come in. So they passed an out-of-state waste ban. We don't want your waste. Supreme Court then declares that garbage is commerce under the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Virginia is sued by Waste Management Corporation. They win. And the state has to pay them damages because uh, they violated the corporation's Commerce Clause rights. Right? Or the state of Iowa. Iowa gets sued by the Smith Co. Foods Corporation. Iowa had this novel idea. They wanted to stop monopoly ownership over pork production so that companies couldn't both own the pigs and own the processing. Because when that happens, corporation controls the entire process and is able to exercise monopoly control to, to uh, gash uh, farmers and push down the price and all that kind of stuff. Smith & Foods Corporation sues contending that the law violates the Commerce Clause because pork production is commerce and wins, right? Uh, the state of Vermont, people in Vermont uh, pass a BGH labeling law that they just want to know whether dairy, not very right, we just want to know whether our dairy products that we're buying and consuming contain artificial bovine growth hormone, which is the stuff they shoot into cows to increase milk production. Right? Pretty simple. Well, the Grocery Retailers Association, of which Monsanto Corporation is a member, sues them, contends that their labeling law violates the corporation's right not to be compelled to speak under the First Amendment. And <laughs> wins.
state agency hearings. You know, the agencies have hearings and you can go and talk about it into the microphone. You know, don't worry, it's not connected, but they talk to the microphone anyway and uh, expect the agency to do X, Y, and Z for them. Uh, but they have a form, so you go and you testify. Well, about two years ago in Virginia, uh, the State Department of Transportation decided that they didn't want rallies to be held in the form of those public comment hearings. So, you know, people go to the public comment thing to, to make trouble. They, you know, they don't want the thing to come in. So that's the point of giving the comments. So the state agencies have gotten worried that it's like infectious. You know, somebody comes in and gives a comment, and people clap, it builds like this energy about people against the project that's coming. So now when you give a comment, they actually give you a number at the door. You know, it's like being in a butcher shop where you take the number and you And you go into a small room and you speak into a cone <laughs> to give your comments. And they tape it. They, they then transcribe your comments, but it's intended so that nobody else can hear what you're saying in that room. And so it's like, how bad does it have to get before we begin to do something real? You know, that the, that the insane begin to take over the asylum. Or as Jane and Morris likes to say, she, she says, grab onto your purse or go over the wall. <laughs> because it seems to be that that's, that's the place we're in, right? Where it's all a dog and pony show and the stuff happens whether we want it to or not. And yet our activism has, is not really commensurate with the problems we now face. In terms of the crises, whether it's uh, a governing authority that we don't have, or the environmental problems that we face, or climate change, or any of this other stuff, we're still in the mode of uh, let's write a letter to Congress, or uh, let's hold a sign, or lead a protest, or buy a Prius, or change a light bulb, or do all the things that have been preset for us in some ways to exercise our powers as consumers, uh, or become a stakeholder in the process, right? I, I guess I'm, I said this last night, so I'm it's fun. Uh, I said uh, last night uh, that I got, I'm getting really tired of people saying, well, we just want a seat at the table. That's all we want. You know, progressives, you know, liberals. Uh, well, you know, all we want is a seat at the table. Well, I got news. We own.
done that for four hours at a time uh, and helping our local government officials. Talk about, do we allow the meetings to get six inches tall or do we allow them to get seven inches tall before we call them a nuisance, right? Uh, and the three people that show up to it, which are sleeping alone is the local newspaper report, because nothing really happens in those meetings anyway because nothing's supposed to happen in those meetings because the structure's been built the way it is. So the major question that we began to ask in these communities that we were assisting in Central Pennsylvania began to ask is, can we build sustainability, economic and environmental sustainability, while operating within that box that has been designed for us? Because if we can, then we can all go home. I mean, it's only 7 o'clock and, you know, football's on. And so we can, we can go home because there's no need to talk about other stuff. But if we come to the conclusion that those doctrines actually prevent us from building the type of system that we need to build, and actually stopping those from harming us who are using those doctrines to do so, then we've got a lot of work ahead of us because we have to dismantle that system and actually create one from almost scratch, right? That's the job that's ahead of us. And so, you know, what does that look like? Well, in 2001, some small municipalities in Pennsylvania began to ban corporate farms. And then, because the conversation began to turn to corporations, because guess what? Four corporations in the United States control 70% of pork production in the United States. One corporation controls 60% of cheese production. It's crap. Five corporations control 70% of chicken production in the United States. You know, so instead of fighting over parts per million or air pollution or water pollution, the types of things that we talk about when we deal with factory farms and other things coming in, which are all really symptoms of something larger, that maybe, just maybe, we should start going upstream and figuring out why those things are happening in the first place and who's making the decisions that affect our communities in an adverse way. And that actually means looking in the agriculture field, at least at the corporatization of agriculture, because that's what we've had over the past uh, 40, 60 years. Our agricultural system has been corporatized. We've lost 600,000 family farmers in the United States. And we always use the word lost. You know, it's very passive. It's like, we can't find them. We've been looking for them, but we can't find them. Well, they've been driven out of business by a thoroughly corporatized system. You know, if you want to do pork production in the United States, if you want to raise pigs in a commercial sense, you can't do it independently anymore and actually get those hogs to market because all those, all those vehicles have been shut down. And they've been shut down by these direct contracts that corporations make with the farmers. They're called output contracts, whereby hogs are raised. And again, a little bit tangential, but we'll touch on it anyway. What do those contracts do? Well, they turn ownership of the farm animals over to the corporation under the agreement. Unless the animal dies, and then title reverts back to the farmer, actually disposes of, uh, of the animal. In addition, the corporation shifts all environmental liability to the farmer to get rid of the environmental liability that might otherwise fall on the corporation. Because they used to buy farms themselves. You used to be driving down the road and see a Smithfield food sign, or see a you know, Hatfield food sign, but they actually bought farms. The problem is, they understood at some point that buying the farms meant that liability flowed with that ownership. So they came up with a new ownership system that, in essence, now transfers all that environmental liability onto the farmers. So it's almost like a surf relationship that farmers have been getting into. And to make it worse, when, yeah, to make it worse, they now take farmers into these output contracts and, in essence, force them to put other family farmers out of business. Because they become a part of the machine that is then thrusting other farms out of business because it's creating a marketplace that the other farmers can't compete in. So it's like the nastiest of stuff happening, right? It's all under the covers, pretty much. Although China is now taking everybody from the rural areas to drive them to the cities because the Chinese understand that industrialization, full industrialization, means you got to get people off the land and you got to stick them into the cities and the factories, right? Which was a nasty little secret about our economic program back in the 20s and the 30s, where we did exactly the same thing, which was to drive farmers off the land. It doesn't sound very sustainable to me. Um, and so, you know, with South Central PA starting to do municipalities starting to pass these corporate and corporate farming laws, a conversation that started to bubble up in Central Pennsylvania, and that conversation wasn't bubbling up from liberal progressive communities. Central Pennsylvania is rural, conservative. These are the guys with the shit kickers and the John Deere hats uh, and the, somebody said belt buckles that would make the Texan crowd. Uh, these are the folks in these rural communities trying to fight these factory farms off. And the conversation uh, was we need to stop these things coming in, but we need to do it in a structural way. One that actually goes after the source of the problem rather than the symptom stuff. 
And to, to this day, I look back and I remember, I have some memories, some fond of others, of us traveling the state, talking to groups of municipal officials all across the state about these issues, about corporate farming and you know, passing local ordinances and doing that kind of work. And I used to tell them, you know, but you have to be careful because even if you pass these ordinances, they can be challenged. You can get sued by the agribusiness corporations because corporations have constitutional rights. And we would go into that. We'd say, here's all the rights that they have. Here's how they got them. And we know all this stuff because we're lawyers, right? And we study it. And we know it. We're the learned advice about all this stuff. We were telling them about corporate rights and that their ordinance could be overturned. And by and large, all the municipal officials and the communities we were working with, their eyes would glaze over. <laughs> and they would say, well, that might be something you, you learned in law school or in history class or grade school or something like that. But it's all academic to us because we live in a democracy. And we've come together and we've passed this law and we're going to enforce this law. And it's a democracy, which means we have the right to do that. Don't bother us with that corporate rights stuff. Don't, uh, we don't understand it. We're not going to take the time to understand it. We just, we just don't get it. And it all sounds very academic to us. All right. So countless meetings after countless meetings after countless meetings trying to talk to people about corporate rights stuff as the superstructure of law and dealing with. Didn't work. Couldn't get the message through. We weren't well known enough to have people listen to us as experts or anything. And so we waited, right? We just waited. These ordinances kept multiplying. Eventually we had 100, 100 communities in Pennsylvania, about a tenth of all the rural municipal townships in Pennsylvania who would now pass these different kinds of laws, which went out to the corporations directly. Lo and behold, our, one of the small municipalities in central Pennsylvania uh, got a knock on the door one morning, and the knock was from the sheriff, the local sheriff. And he was serving a complaint on the municipality. The municipality had been sued. So the local township officials got a copy of the complaint, looked at it, sure enough, on page one, it said, we are an agribusiness corporation. We are persons under the law, and you have violated, by passing this anti-corporate farming law, our 14th Amendment rights to equal protection of the law. 14th Amendment equal protection says, as persons, all persons have a right to equal application and protection of the laws. The lawsuit said, we are corporate persons, and your law discriminates against us because it bans corporate farmers, but doesn't ban family farmers from engaging in farming. And because you've distinguished the two within your law, you've now violated our constitutional rights to equal protection under the Constitution. Right? And so I got a call from one of the supervisors, one of the council officials, and he said, now we understand what you've been trying to tell us. Right? But we didn't have the battery power to do it. We actually had to provoke a response to come in the door to prove what we had predicted to actually make it real to folks because everything is so camouflaged and hidden that we actually needed the power of the system to kick back to do our organizing for us. It was almost like the first time we began to understand how to use the energy of the existing system to actually forward the organizing that needed to happen along these lines. So what happened next? Well, those supervisors became famous. And these hundred municipalities that had been talking about these issues for a while, because they had been lawmaking in a different way, not about the symptoms, but about the corporations, then began to talk about this case that the corporations had brought against the municipality and the corporate rights that were used against the municipality. And so there was even more interest in these places about doing something about uh, not just the corporate farms, but something structural. And so we were again talking to groups, and at the one meeting I remember the guy in the back, John Deere hat and everything, he stood up and he said, well, Mr. Lindsay, what good does it do to pass these ordinances if corporate rights can then be used to actually come in and strike them down? We can get sued by a corporation. And I said, well, that's what we've been telling you for years, haven't you been listening? And he said, yes, we have been listening. And he said, we want to take a step forward and actually do something more. And I said, well, what could possibly be more? We're already taking on the corporate farmers, you know, the largest corporations in the United States and globally on food production. This food folks are standing up. I said, what, what do you want us to do? And he said, we want you to draft us an ordinance that refuses to recognize corporate constitutional rights within our municipality. <laughs> Either that 
are thrown in the towel and allow these boys to come in because we're not insulating our ordinances properly. In other words, that's how they saw it in this logical thought progression they were going through. Not only do we have to pass these laws, but we have to enforce them, and we can't enforce them if corporate rights are a superstructure that come in to actually not allow us to enforce them. It's very clear, logical thinking, uh, you know, uh, which was opposite of what we were using when we say, you can't do it. And he said, well, work with us, and we don't know whether we'll you know, eventually pass it. we got to talk to constituents and have meetings and advertise and all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, that sounds like fun. And so uh, we went back to the office, at that point completely disillusioned with the regulatory process, and took the lead with them. And we drafted the nation's first corporate rights elimination ordinance that actually stripped corporations. And we increasingly don't use the word strip because we don't think they're legitimate in the first place. And so refused to recognize these claims to corporate constitutional rights within their municipality. And we handed it off to them. A little place called Licking Township uh, in Clarion County, just north of Pittsburgh. And they advertised it. It actually appeared in the newspaper, and the newspaper didn't catch on fire. Uh, and uh, then had an actual public hearing, public meeting, to actually consider the passage of the ordinance. And we drove up, you know, two hour drive, because we weren't going to miss it for the world. I sat in the back, you know, and they had, you know, the, just to set the scene, you know, these rural municipalities in Pennsylvania, they don't have enough funding to actually have a building of their own. So they need the salt shed, where the salt is piled up in the middle for winter, because the elected officials actually drive the, the machines. They drive the trucks to drop the salt on the road. And so, you know, you have a light bulb hanging from the ceiling, swinging back and forth. It's like that horror movie. And then you have people set up on, on folding chairs around the salt, the salt amount, essentially. What happened that night was a uh, conversation I, I, I couldn't have and still can't have with most of my lawyer peers uh, because that's, it's beyond them. Uh, but in that room that night, Farmer showed up in that building with uh, copies of, of Tom Paine's Common Sense that they had downloaded from the internet and actually read it into the record that was being kept in the public hearing. Other folks showed up with Article 1, Section 1 of the Pennsylvania Constitution that says that people are the source of all governing authority. And asked questions like, well, if we're the source of all governing authority, what gives Waste Management Corporation or Senegal Corporation or the other corporation the power to come in and actually tell us we can't do what we need to do to protect our own health, safety, and welfare? How is that possible? And the conversation I heard that night was, was simply, simply astounding to me. Uh, and then the supervisors, the three of them, voted unanimously to become the first municipality in the United States to actually refuse to recognize corporate constitutional rights within their municipality. A uh, little place where they can People about the fact that the only way that corporations are able to do what they do is because they're enabled by the system of law and the state government to do it. So they're not called permits for nothing. They actually permit the activity to occur, and they're handed out like hotcakes by the state legislature and by the state agencies. So the problem we face is not the corporation. When the communities rise up to do something, they don't meet the corporation first. They actually meet our structural law first. The problem is not corporations. The problem is that we live in a corporate state, right, where the corporate boys and the minority of people that run them actually control our state government and control the federal government. So that people actually understood how the state was enabling the corporation to do what it did. But the problem was not just the corporation. The problem was the governmental system that's operating. Not only just the legal doctrines, but also the fact that the corporations can use the state government at will. So there was like this festering revolution, revolt, starting to happen. It was small. It still is small. Uh, but disparate communities trying to deal with this stuff. Because when you look at the whole systems approach, it's very clear that we don't live in a democracy. We don't really have decision-making control over almost anything. And so our activism is very anemic. It's about assuming that we live in a democracy and trying to mobilize large numbers of people to do X, Y, and Z. You know, pressure politics, which we've gotten, you know, has been our mode of operating. But, you know, the idea of actually exercising democracy as the collective people in this country has become so radical a notion that nobody even really raises it. So when they pass these kind of things and the corporations come in, it's not like a regulatory battle where they can hire their experts to testify about parts per million or water pollution or other pollution or particulates or those types of things, which they've gotten really good at over the past 50 years. But instead, it becomes a battle of rights versus rights. Uh, you have communities now actually passing sustainable energy ordinances, which ban all unsustainable energy transmission through their community. And so there's a lot of new activism starting to happen 
folks breaking free of the old shell and moving into new things. And people ask us, where, where is all this headed, right? And we say, we don't know. It's going to head wherever the people doing the work take it. That's the easiest answer. Uh, but the fact is, in five states now, there are enough communities that have come together, that, that have passed these ordinances and local laws, and have come together, uh, stitched themselves together to form statewide organizations. Uh, and just a couple weeks ago in Oregon, you had the birth of the Oregon Community Rights Network. A statewide network that's actually going to begin to drive state constitutional change with an understanding that these doctrines that control the box that we're in actually can only be uh, derailed or gotten rid of both through the state constitutional change but also through federal constitutional change. And so next year, uh, for the first time, these state community rights efforts are going to gather. People meeting each other for the first time from different states to actually begin to envision what a new federal constitution would look like, you know, or what amendments would look like. So I'll say the question I asked yesterday, you know, at the other presentation was, what are we waiting for? <laughs> I mean, what exactly are we waiting for? Uh, what is left to lose exactly? I mean, in, in some ways. And it's time to get off our asses, and we of course have been off our asses for a while, but begin to do work that actually takes the thing over. That, that actually begins to dismantle these doctrines and builds a whole new system of law. So the exciting stuff is, in Oregon, it is coming along with folks who are now being frontally disobedient to a structure of law that guarantees that their agricultural system is going to be invaded by GMOs. Uh, and uh, that work is going to spread, and we hope that you guys decide to become a part of it. Thank you. Our guest today has been Thomas Lindsay, founder of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Learn more about them at CELDF, C -E -L -D -F .org, and here in Portland, engage with the community rights movement at communityrightspdx.org. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org. I hope you'll watch us again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock. I never heard my money talk When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I'll believe they're human like me